Welcome in everyone to a very special episode of the David Hookstead Show. Happy to have you all here. We are joined today by John Shrek McPhee, also known as the Sheriff of Baghdad. John, thank you for uh, being here today. Hey, what's up? What's up? <laughs> so the first thing I want to jump into right away with you is where were you on 9-11? Oh, great question. Um, on 9-11, I was at the drop zone in Rayford. Um, I was trying to get a few jumps because I was supposed to I was supposed to uh, go to a tandem bundle course, uh, either that or was free fall instructor, but uh, I was training up to go to another free fall course. So I was at the drop zone. Uh, I was jumping with the Golden Knights because they're out there every day, right? And we got a pretty, uh, we invite them to our course. They come to our courses. So we have a good relationship with them. So I was out there with them and uh, we're rigging up to go jump, stuff like that. And then it's like, uh, hey, the plane's grounded. You know, it's like, yeah, this happens a few times a day. So we're just standing there for a little bit. A little while later goes by. Uh, and then uh, it's like, yeah, some guy crashed into the trade center, like in an airplane. It was like, yeah, dumbass, right? Uh, and then uh, we de-rig, we go in the team room, turn on CNN, and that's when you see it. So I had to go back to the compound, of course. A uh, lot of stuff happening. Uh, essentially, I was my squadron commander because my squadron was somewhere else. Uh, and like I had to tune into the Joint Chiefs of Staff, you know, like I'm just a mid-level enlisted guy. The only reason I'm in this meeting is because I'm the senior guy from my squadron. Right. And then like I'm sitting there with the other squadron commanders like uh, I was just at the drop zone. Why? Why am I even in this meeting? Like, can't can't you do without the, uh, my guys for today? Obviously not. Right. So, uh, they go around the room and the JCS like goes around the room, you know, video conferences, even then. And, uh, <laughs> I'm like, you know, what about your squadron? And I just exactly ver repeated what the B squadron commander said, who was a friend of mine. Right. I just, I, I was a, our squadrons up, we're ready to go standing by for follow on missions or whatever that guy said. And like, uh, yeah. So how long then did it take from, and to let our viewers know, uh, John is a member of Delta Force at this point in time, which is the military's most elite military unit. I guess I should have said that in the intro, that's on me. So that's why he's in the situation he's in. But how long did it take from when 9-11 happened for you guys to gear up and get ready and then get over to Afghanistan and start pounding some bad guys? Um, I was in Afghanistan by November. So not long, about two months, roughly five weeks. Yeah. yeah, I think other guys were, I think the FIP group guys were a little quicker in there only because, you know, they're generally in the Middle East anyway. And and what is the mindset after 9-11? Is it get us there, get us some targets, get us some stuff we can hit? Or was there a lot of confusion? Was there a clarity? What was going through your head? I think at that time it was pretty simple. Uh, killer, killer capture bin Laden. End of discussion. Um, how that was going to happen? Well, who the fuck knows how that goes down, right? Um, you know, why? Because something like this hadn't happened before. It's not like, you know, today where if a terrorism, uh, something happened on the planet, there, people are so much more in place for stuff like that uh, back then, but, or versus now. So, um, yeah, the thing is killer capture bin Laden, you know, though it was never get in a ground war with the Afghans, right? Because this is where armies go to die. If you read where the bear came over the mountain or any of the Russian AARs, like I could have collected, I could have told you in November 2001, Afghans, Afghanistan, Afghanistan's a shit show. It's going to be a shit show. It's going to be a shit show all the way until we fucking leave. And then it's going to get worse. And that was the fine print going in. So we were just looking to kill, capture bin Laden at that point. And there wasn't really a whole lot of plan out there because no one knew where he was, right? Like, how do you make a plan when we don't have a place? We don't have a... So there was a lot of blanks on our information sheet that we had to fill out till we could make some better education and guesses that would lead to better information that would lead to actual intel later which leads to right where we are now 
So you, I believe, are the first person I've ever spoken to in the interview capacity that was at Tora Bora. Now, if someone watching this that I've interviewed previously was, and I didn't know that, my apologies. But I really want to zero in on that because um, I don't, I don't know much about it. I've never spoken to anyone who's been there on the record about it. But how did you guys zero in? Is Tora Bora is the region we're going to? So. Um... Before we deployed, uh, it was all where is Bin Laden right now, right? And I think there was kind of two efforts going on here. One effort was prosecuting the Afghanistan piece of what is our response to the government of Afghanistan, right? Um, and at the same time, you know, what do we do about Bin Laden, right? Because He's just in Afghanistan. He's not right. the governor. He's not anything. He just lives there, right? So this kind of complicates stuff. And if you go back and read any history, you will say, you'll see George Bush gave Mullah Omar 48 hours to give up bin Laden. And he had every intent to give up bin Laden, except for George Bush acted at hour 40. So if we had waited eight more hours, you think the Afghans would have handed them over to us? I think the Taliban would have been our friends, and I think they would have handed over bin Laden, or he would have had to take off, and we'd have followed him somewhere else. And guess where that somewhere else is? Pakistan. And we knew that all along. That, see, that's I, I had never heard that. I'm only 30 years old, so I was a young kid when the invasion of Afghanistan kicked off. But see, that's why I'm asking, because that's new information. Mm -hmm. To me and the viewers, how long from when you got on the ground in Afghanistan did it take to get in contact with the enemy? Was it right away? Was it a couple of days? Well, we had a fit. Look, no one in these, in any situation where a war starts out like this, it's chaos. No one knows what the fuck is going on. There's no government in place. There's no anything. I mean, think about, think about the United States being without laws, without police, and without any local governments or, or any government. And then how do you think America would act on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, it'd be fucking anarchy. This is Afghanistan. This is every war-torn country, right? No one, knows, no one knows who's in charge, who's not in charge, right? I mean, it's more so who, who shouldn't be in charge in the situation than who's actually in charge. Right. Gotcha. So as you walk down these situations, they're incredibly chaotic. No one knows what's going on. So we have to get on the ground, figure out what's going on, where this guy is, and then we're going to have to move forward from there. Right. And whatever that forward is, is whatever that forward is. You can never pre-plan for something when you don't know what it is. Right. That makes perfect right. sense. You can, you can walk in with, uh, I don't know, a healthy bit of skepticism, maybe uh, maybe some confidence and experience of other stuff, right? But you're not walking into this going, yeah, we got this, right? Not not then anyway. Maybe today, different ball game. We've been we've been doing this for twenty plus years now. You know that you know uh, was the last one, Baghdadi. That guy didn't have a chance, and he didn't even fucking know it. You know what I mean? Where yeah. no no one knew how this was going to go then. So it was super chaotic. Um, we had to figure out where to be and why, where's bin Laden, where's the best place that he could be, you know, because the first thing these guys do is they cut ties with everybody, bodyguards, cooks. Um, I think there was a, was it the Libyan bodyguard that was with them all the time? The Libyan bodyguard, I think it was the Libyan bodyguard, the cook and the driver, those three. So it's kind of where we put all our eggs in one basket. Right. And then we found out, I think, and I'm, you know, this is a long time ago, and then I'm not sure which piece came in when, but um, we found out his, his, either his driver or his cook lived just outside Tora Bora. Hmm. Interesting. A guy that he can, he's never been without in the past 10 to 20 years lives here. Hmm. Interesting. Right. And then I think the Libyan had already been captured. So out of the core of who's around them, who's left. So uh, we get intel, he's in Tora Bora. So 
we make our way to Tora Bora. And, and I'd like to say making our way to Tora Bora, there's no fucking roads in Afghanistan. At this I was going to ask you about know what that. I mean? yeah. like it took us hours. It took me 26 hours, I think, to, nah, it probably took more than that. We had to stop. I bet I have about 35 hours of driving from Jalalabad to Tora Bora, which is like 70 miles. I mean, like the, the distance is it's fucking chump change, right? But the problem is, is, how the fuck do you get there? You could follow a map and you could follow most roads and truck trails, stuff like that. You know, the places that more vehicles drive the most. However, um, there's no easy way to get there. And then you, you drive and a truck would go between these two huge boulders. And you're like thinking, why go between those two? Why not these two? How about that one? Like, how the fuck do they know, right? So uh, in an incredibly bumpy ride where we, we would count how many times the vehicle would bottom out to judge how bad a bump was. Um, I think my kidneys were bruised by oh, the end man. of those 35 hours. So even getting there was a major journey within itself. And on that journey, I think we had a Mexican standoff with an entire village. Uh, uh, just getting there was a whole nother world within itself. And, and for our viewers sitting at home, there's uh, some famous photos in the military community of the guys at Tora Bora. And you weren't really dressed in traditional military clothing. So could you tell our audience how you guys kind of were blending into the local area? Yeah. So, um, yeah, we don't have to wear, you know, you know, an army doesn't have to wear uniforms. They do that out of like discipline, organization, responsibility, right? Like a lot of stuff goes with that. You know, uh, you don't, you can basically on the battlefield, you can wear anything you want. Right. And there's some law land warfare out there after World War II about not being in a uniform and being a spy and blah, blah, blah. <sighs> Afghanistan does not apply. Terrorism does not apply to right. fighting another army. Right. So right. it's not the same. Right. So uh, before we went in the Tora Bora Mountains, um, we wanted to get a bunch of local garb blankets they always throw the blanket over their shoulder right we want to get blankets and hats and shit so uh i took the uh squadron supply guy the money guy down to uh, chicken street in kabul right and this is where you go buy it still i think today where you buy all your trinkets and then um i went down there and i bought like I don't know, hundreds of blankets and sweaters you know like mr roger button up sweaters right um, I bought uh, the old pickle suit army pants, right? And uh, the pickle suit army pants, back in the day when the army, before the OG 107, the army wore the pickle suit. The pickle suit was a OG green with like, had like flaps over the pockets. It had a cargo pocket. It's just a, just a certain style of uniform the army used to wear. They call it the pickle suit. I bought a bunch of different sizes of pickle suit pants, right? So basically going into Tora Bora, uh, most guys would have had the boots, whatever they were wearing, um, your OG 107 pickle, pickle suit army pants, um, which was American surplus. Uh, you'd have your wool sweater, a button down wool sweater and a wool blanket. And then the cool yeah, the head. hat yeah. yeah yeah the hats the moosh uh, hat yeah so when you finally get to tora bora um what is the order of how combat goes because it's a heavy cave system it's a mountain system for people watching at home is it drop the ordinances and then we're going to start searching caves how did that whole process work yeah so um somehow we get intel we had bin laden was in tora bora so we drive, uh, we drive to Jalalabad. We rest for a few hours, which I thought was overnight. Literally, I drive. I drive to a safe house. Gates open. Pull in. 
pack trucks in, go in this house, keep quiet so no one sees you, hears you. Uh, literally, I passed the fuck out. Like I've been driving, out. I passed out. I'd been driving for like 26 hours. Yeah. Uh, my bosses at the time were dicks and like neither one of them wanted to drive. So I had to drive the whole time. And I'm like, so you fucking idiots think it's safer for me to drive for 28 hours than one of you motherfuckers to sleep a little bit and replace me so we don't drive and drop off the, I don't know. I'm going to call that 7,000 feet right there. I'm looking down right now. And neither, and they're like, yeah, we're not driving. You can drive the whole way. Jeez. So I drove the whole way. Um Drove the whole way, took my speed, and then as soon as we got to Jalalabad, I got in this house. Literally, I set a backpack against the door in a hallway. I was out. And then I, someone woke me up. We got to go. I figured I'd slept for like a day or something. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I didn't know how long I slept for. It was only a few hours. It was still dark out. Um, so uh, I crashed. I woke up. We were on the drive again. And then... Um, we got just outside of Tora Bora, right about sun up, and uh, we dropped a twenty thousand pound the daisy cutter on uh, Bin Laden's location at the time. Um, that was a big mushroom cloud. I'd never seen anything like that at the time. Um, it was kind of far away, so you don't get a. I never really got it in dropping the bomb from like watching it in the distance. You see the mushroom cloud. It's a big cloud, but you don't get a sense of the size. Right. And then later, later we're walking through the mountains and it's just like this. I don't know. It's just, it just starts getting white. This is like apocalypse now shit. Everything's white. And you're like, why is everything white here? I was in the crater that we dropped the 20,000 oh, pound bomb. And it's like, you know, you know, gray, you know, gray rock. I'm not a geologist. Let's say it's limestone. I don't know what kind of stone it is, but like a gray rock, when it gets pulverized, it's white. The, the dust was all white. So it left this. I don't know. If I had to give it a size, I'd say it was like 60 feet across, maybe 20 feet deep, maybe more, maybe even bigger from that thing in rock in the mountain like yeah and so do they keep calling in airstrikes in or at this point is it on you guys to kind of get in gunfights so uh we moved up <clears throat> it's kind of hard to get to the front because you got the press we got to get through the press right like afghani get... press or american press no, american press why is american press in tora bora right now how do they beat us there who the fuck knows right that's crazy so, well think about this if you ever thought the media was just propaganda think about how they beat us to the Tora Bora that's nuts that's a great question I'd love an answer on that yeah I'll tell you how the news is dirty it's propaganda those fuckers play all sides so they can make money but um <clears throat> anyway when we finally get in the mountains right um there's kind of a couple different ways so we take the bulk of the guys and we send them around the mountains to kind of flank these guys to keep them from getting into Pakistan. And then uh, me and a couple of guys went just straight after them, straight up the money, straight down the middle, keep the pressure on them. Um, we shot at them. We bombed them. You name it, whatever we could do. We killed a lot. of. I don't know how many. I'm going to tell you this. We killed so many people those first few days at Tora Bora. There's no way I could even ever count, right? So if you hear a guy count of how many people he's killed, this is complete fucking bullshit. Because when you're in a situation where, and I've, done, I've been in this a few times with the unit, we'll take all comers, bring it, bring your best. We're going to kill everyone here today and we're all going to walk away. And it's going to be a long day and it's going to be a lot of work, but every one of you guys is going to die. And then- you want That's to do this tomorrow, we'll do this again tomorrow. <laughs> and then you want to do it the next day. So Tora Bora went on like that for 10 days. And then uh, me and one of two other guys, one being my Air Force guy, dropped every bomb dropped in Afghanistan for like 10 days. Every piece of ordnance was dropped by like basically two of us, but three of us total. 
And, and how close do you think at this point in time, if you had to guess, or maybe you know, how close are you to Bin Laden, his physical presence? I could see him. You could see him. I was hearing all his radio phone calls. We had the radios. We had everything. Okay, so this is what I want to dive into. And I've seen um, a guy from the unit who has since passed away years ago, did like a 60 minutes um, hit about it. Why do you feel that you guys, um, I think in the interview, he claimed that you guys wanted to go into Pakistan and cut him off and the U.S. government wouldn't let you do it. And that you kind of felt handcuffed or he felt handcuffed. What do you think went wrong at Tora Bora? We were sold out by the fucking leadership of the government. Of the of our government. Of our government. That's what this guy said in that interview too. I, I mean, didn't want think, to say that yet. Think about this. Think about this. <clears throat> and here's why I think we sold ourselves out. And here's why I think we're our own worst enemy. And this is why I do not work for the government amongst a million of these reasons. <clears throat> Think about this. The first 10 days in the war on terror, the United States sends 10 guys to your mountain stronghold, which with thousands of guys, the Russians couldn't get bin Laden out of there. It took 10 of us 10 days to kill almost everyone there and almost kill him. Think about this. We killed bin Laden first 10 days of the war. Where's the war on terror going to be? After that day, where it's fucking over, you fuck with America, they come and kill you within fucking 10 days. Who else is going to do that? Where's the war on terror go? But don't follow me down that rabbit hole, follow me down this rabbit hole. Okay, how much money did the CIA and DOD get out of Afghanistan and Iraq over all those years? I would, an astronomical amount, I would assume. So, so. We could kill bin Laden right now and end this. Or if he was still alive, that checkbook would be open for a very long time. I got you. That's interesting. And and were the locals that you guys were linking up with or that were supposed to be supportive of the U.S.? I've heard other people claim they were completely useless and that not only were they useless, they might have been given information to Al Qaeda and the Taliban. And I'm wondering if you have an opinion on that. Um, yeah, I would say useless is a gross overstatement. <laughs> so they were bad. Yeah. They, okay. I got it. So, no. They were worthless and, and they knew they were worthless and they were just waiting for the fucking handout. Uncle sugar. What does he do around the planet? Right. He either kills people or he hands shit out. Well, we're not dead. So give us shit. That's what people right. think. Right. Um, onto a different, uh, topic in Afghanistan. I heard you in other interviews talk about a solo mission or doing solo missions, Mm -hmm. which is very rare, uh, even for the unit, possibly maybe you were the only one in Afghanistan. Could you walk our audience through what that was like in it? You know, is that scarier than when you have support guys with you, when you got a team with you, or is it an adrenaline rush? Cause you're just, you're just on your own. What's that like? Oh yeah. Uh, I was, I was alone in Tora Bora is where I was alone. Uh, And I actually snatched a guy alone who was the last guy to see bin Laden leave the Tora Bora mountains. Um, And what I would say about going out alone is, you know, you're with 10 or 12 guys, 10 guys with 10 guys. What could I do with 10 guys to illustrate this? With 10 good dudes in the height of the Afghan war, let's just say that was in my county in the United States. With my 10 guys, I could have killed every law enforcement officer, every politician, anybody who opposed us. And I would start running this county the way I see fit. And now I would be in charge. And people refer to me a warlord because there was times where I ran my own sectors and the decision comes to me, you know, you're going to get the thumbs down from this guy. I don't care if you live or die. Um, so 10 guys, 12 guys, 15 guys can get a lot of work done more than, you know, right. Especially good dudes, right. Unit guys. <clears throat> Having said that it would take 
for to sort out Afghanistan between who's good, who's bad. See, the the biggest problem with Afghanistan is there's no good or bad, and there's no right or wrong. Right? There's none of that. Right. So, okay. So you take 10 good dudes, or we could have anything we want, right? We could have taken anything we want, but you're not going to be able to get those guys into an area without someone noticing. And this is where one person comes along is gotcha. one person can come along and you may not be, be suspicious of this person, right? 10 dudes. I mean, think about this. 10 fit guys, beard, mid thirties show up in your town and they're like six inches taller than everyone else. Yeah. They're, they're going to stick out like a sore thumb. Yeah. Right. So one person wouldn't do that. Right. So um, now having said that, because I'm always with 10 guys and we can take or do anything we want, anywhere we want, you never really get a chance to learn, to expand your mind or learn these other decisions you could have made that you wouldn't make with those other guys. Right. So I probably learned how to conduct war at a smarter level, a hundred to one every second I was out alone. In so, it's a, it's, so it's a learning experience is what you're saying. hundred percent a learning experience. Cause I gotta be honest, you know, I wasn't worried about dying. Cause I gotta be honest, if I'm going to die, you know, how many people around me are going to be dead? A lot. So I'm, um, I'm already, I know this, I'm already in for this. Who's, who's the first comer. Gotcha. Right? So I never felt nervous or scared or an adrenaline rush. It's all about, if anything, remaining calm and then problem solving your way out of it, right? The problem is when you're with a dozen dudes, problem solving could be like, ah, fuck it. Let's just kill him and move on. That's the way to do it, right? And maybe that's the best answer. And then sometimes, even though it is the best answer, well, we just killed this dude. So his son's going to hate us. His wife's going to hate us. The rest of his family's going to hate us. So right. essentially we just created more terrorists on, right. a flip of a coin. Yeah. on a flip of a coin decision. Fuck them. Right. And, and guess what? The more days you get shot at, the more your friends get hurt, the more you've been injured, the more fuck them gets to be just the easiest and safest answer for everybody. Right. Well, that's I'm not, that. Br- I'm not saying that's right. I'm just no, no, I, I, I understand your point. That le- I had a question about the rules of engagement. So when you go in there in the early days of the war on terror, especially when you're in a tier one unit like Delta Force, is the rules of engagement essentially, uh, certainly in the Tora Bora region, if you see a guy who looks at you wrong and he's got an AK, drop him. Or was it really restrictive? Oh, I would say this. In the beginning of a war, when chaos is happening, no one knows what's going on the fucking rules of engagement or whatever the fuck you think they are right now. Gotcha. And the U S leaves that decision up to most 19 year olds, by the way, Uh, you know what I mean? Vietnam, world war two. Right. So um, yeah, I think uh, you have to be able to make these better decisions. Right. And these better decisions, look, war is always going to be a dirty business. Right. And you can't be lily white and do war at the same time. You can't, that the, 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 the two don't meet. Right. And anybody who thinks the American army is the knight and shining is the white knight. There is no white knight. The white knight never existed because if he had to kill somebody, he got fucking dirty. <laughs> and, right. and, and I wouldn't call anybody who kills people for other people white in any that term right so having said that most people when you're out alone it's easy to make these bad when you're out alone you have to make the right decision when you're with other dudes who are armed and you're worried about less less of a good decision has to be made so and everybody knows the special operation people know this if you need a good decision this requires a good decision Sometimes there's stuff out there where we'll just keep going until maybe the good decision presents itself, right? Right. So there's different ways it could pan out. 
Gotcha. Well, th that's all fascinating to me. And, and I, I mean, a solo mission just seems so unbelievably gutsy, but neat. That's why I had to ask. Now I want to pivot to a rock because uh, you have a nickname, which we're going to get into in a moment, which is obviously tied to a rock, but how early were you in a rock when the, were you there right away when the invasion started? Did you come later? So I got to Iraq maybe March of 03, but uh, I left Pakistan uh, as a Pakistani officer in their special forces to go right to Iraq. Wait, so, so hold on. Let me rewind there real quick. What were you doing in Pakistan? I was an officer in their special forces. Is like training, like training their special forces or as a full on PAC military officer? Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I understand. We'll leave it. At I that. was the I, guy in charge in combat. How's that sound to you? That that's per No, that's that, that clears it up. That's crazy. I'm sure there's a lot. Is that something you can talk about or is that kind of an off the table thing? Uh, I was a major in the Pakistani special forces for a little while. And we, can, and how, we can leave it at that. Okay, fair enough. We'll leave it at that. So let's go back to Iraq. So I flew oh. from there to Iraq. Okay. And go on, sorry. I had to go from the hinterland into Islamabad. I got on an airplane. I flew to Kuwait City. I get to Kuwait City. There was a C-130 on the tarmac waiting for me. But in the Kuwait City airport, when you're in the terminal... I could look out the glass to the tarmac and see my airplane and my guys. But how do you tell somebody you got to get there and you don't speak the language? Right. That had to be difficult. <laughs> so anyway, I found a guy, customs guy. Um, how do I know he was a customs guy? He brought me behind everything, behind all the locked doors. He didn't have a uniform on, you know, white dress to his ankles. <laughs> Look like everyone else, everyone wears at it. You know what I mean? Um, long white shirt. So he brought me to this bus, like, you know, them big wide buses that like take you from like one terminal to the next. I was the only one on that. I drove to the back of this airplane. I got off. This dude's with me and he's like, he's pointing at a plane. I'm like, yeah, right. And the dude walks up like, you're late. Let's go. And the dude was like, uh, I, you know, this is, this is, he's doing the, this is you. And I'm like, yeah, this is me. And I get on and I flew away. Uh, I land, I was at, I was, uh, I land, I go to the uh, Saddam's private terminal. And uh, I lived in Saddam's private terminal. And I went in, from in, in Baghdad, in Baghdad at okay. the Baghdad airport. Um, I went from shitting in a hole in the ground in Pakistan, eating UN rice and flies as my primary source of protein uh, to I had like a four or six head gold shower. You know what I mean? I had a gold toilet. I'm washing my face in a gold sink. Like the first thing I did is wash myself from Pakistan. You know what I mean? Like leave that old crud off me. I need I need Iraq crud on me. Right. So uh I had a gold sink well you know and i would just think every morning washing my face out of this gold sink like see this gold sink and the shower with the gold heads this is how you war here you don't war with the <laughs> shitting in the hole in the ground no one wants that no one wants so that. so is that where the sheriff of baghdad story the nickname comes from or is it tied to something else um the sheriff of baghdad came a little later but yeah i did a lot of time in baghdad and i did a lot of i did hundreds of solo missions in baghdad it, as a cab driver most of my rotations and uh i want to i want to rewind just the shade to when the invasion kicked off what was the honest perception of the u.s military certainly guys at your level um of iraq's capabilities because i've interviewed a few guys uh that were in delta that came in from the saudi arabian side when the invasion started and they've all they all said essentially we knew we were going to smoke them like we knew that we were going to obliterate the iraqi military not not the occupation, but the military itself. Did you feel that same way? Yes, but I would say I, I didn't feel it like that. I looked at it this way. In Afghanistan, on a scale of one to 10, I'd give the Afghanis a two. 
right on on fighting ability yeah 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 like war ability fighting whatever you call it right on a scale of one to ten as an army i'd give them a two right i'd give the average american army on a scale of one to ten a five right so i figured the iraqis were under a five makes sense above yep, a two yep. under a five. Below. Got okay it. now <clears throat> terrain in afghanistan to go kill this two on a scale of one to ten you got to go over terrain that is generally a fucking 10. So this makes a 14 out of 20. Of course, this is hard to do because of the terrain, not because of this guy. So great. Right. Right. Iraq, no terrain on a scale of one to 10 Iraq. That's the two. There ain't nowhere a tank, a helicopter can't go in Iraq. Right. Gotcha. So think about this. Let's, let's just give the Iraq army a four. Let's just say they're one notch below our army. Let's give them the four. Your terrain is a two. Right, That's so a, they're a six. They're a six. Yeah, they're going to get pummeled. And we just rolled over them every night, rolled over. Um, that, is, that is just nuts. In terms of where the fiercest – now, the, the way you just laid it out with the scale was interesting because of the terrain and the abilities – but in terms of the pure intensity of the combat itself, once the bullets started flying, was it worse in Iraq or Afghanistan? I don't think it was worse in either one. And I don't, I don't want to make light of either one, but at the same time, if you have a good plan and you stay to it and you know what you're doing and you had a little bit of experience, I didn't think either one of them were dangerous. That's, that's no. very interesting. Can they be dangerous? Absolutely. Hey, could you eat a, a, a landmine today and be gone forever? Absolutely, right? So, you know, I'm not striking that from the record, but at the same time, like, I always felt like if I was on the ground in a vehicle, right, I'll live no matter what. I'll live in a helicopter where I'm not flying, I'm useless. You know what I mean? It, it's fascinating you mentioned that. I was interviewing a group of guys like a month ago and they were talking about how no one wants to die. They were Delta Force guys. They're like, no one wants to die in a helicopter because you don't have any control if that thing gets shot down. They're like, on the ground, your rifle in your hand, you're the dictator in that situation. In a helicopter, if the, if the RPGs are coming up, you're at the whims of whatever's about to happen. It sounds like you feel the exact same way. Yeah. So in situations where I could control the outcome somewhat, I was never worried, but like, you know, helicopters, airplanes, these fucking, you know, we got man pads as you're trying to come in the fucking Bagram or something. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, right. Like, um, this is going to play into a second question here, but what, did you view uniformed Iraqi soldiers who were just fighting in the Iraqi army during the invasion versus the foreign fighters who then flooded the country for no other reason than to try to kill Americans? Did you view them as equal or did you view the foreign fighters as substantially worse? And they didn't, they weren't soldiers. They were just full-blown terrorists. Yeah. Um, procedurally we kind of treat them all like all the same uh for for safeguard reasons for us for them um however i would say like i don't think um yeah foreign fighters fucking kill every one of them right now iraqis regular iraqis how do you tell the difference you kind of can't, right? So if it's just someone out in public, like a regular Iraqi, like try to treat, I always try to treat the Iraqis with a little bit of uh, indifference and compassion, right? Because there's people in war that may not like Americans that don't need their family dying for no reason either. Right. You know what I mean? So, uh, however, 
Iraqi police or Iraqi army, yo, you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. I'm going to drop you like a fucking bad habit because I don't know if you're clean, if you're dirty. I don't know who you are, why you are, but you're here right now in this bad situation showing up with a, a badge and a gun. Now nah, the badge don't get you too far, but that gun's going to get you dead real quick. So I am fascinated by the mm -hmm. fact you brought that up because that actually plays perfectly into the second one, which is Zarqawi. Now, you were involved in the task force that got Zarqawi. Is that correct? Yeah, I was out that day. Yeah. Okay. I, I read in a book uh, that Iraqi police kind of acted as Zarqawi's QRF after mm -hmm. those bombs got dropped. Mm -hmm. they and had then, him in an ambulance. And, mm -hmm. and so that is true. That is a mm -hmm. true statement. And mm -hmm. what did the Americans do when those Iraqi cops tried to protect Zarqawi? Not, and he was already in an ambulance. But he, so, so they, they had loaded him up and they were about to drive him away when the guys showed up. And the guys who showed up were Delta operators, is that correct? Mm -hmm. And Zarqawi then died shortly thereafter mm -hmm. for yeah. now. Yeah, okay. He so died of his, hey, he his, died of his, it legitimately died of his injuries. The guys never fucked with him. They didn't have perfect. to. All, yeah, like there's a ton of rumors out there uh there might have they might have been like hey what's that phone number you call to help somebody out uh i don't remember it you're gonna die there might have been some good jokes going around but like a guy who is mortally wounded is gonna die in it yeah he's gonna take long um i've always been fascinated by the zarqawi stuff because you don't hear much about it like it's not talked about like bin laden or some other people but the dude, especially people my age, that guy was a motherfucking monster. Is that correct? Dude, on a scale of one to 10, he was the fucking 10 compared to the rest of them. He didn't give a fuck. Fuck you. You're dying. But the reality is, is like, look, I want to make this real clear. This, the whole GWAT, everything we talked about, it's not about religion. Never was. It's about money and fucking power. Just like here in the States. It's money and power. That's all people want. You know what I mean? Religion is the smoke screen that these guys use to get right. money and power. That's it. Right. So, you know, all these guys like this is this is a holy war. This is a crusade. This is no. Basically, we're going out and killing dirty politicians is what we're doing, because that's all these guys are. Money and power. That's, that's all these guys want. And Zarqawi was the fucking 10 and he wanted it all and he will kill you to get it. Don't even fucking don't test them on it. Damn. And they dropped two 500 pound bombs from an F-16 on him, right? In the compound he was in. Man, that was a long time ago, but I thought it was more than that. It, it might have been. I might be misquoting. So don't yeah. don't hold that I, one against me. Yeah. But. but yes, they did drop a lot of hundreds of pounds of ordnance on the house or whatever he was in. Yeah. Damn. That is, that's crazy. So, okay. Can you explain the nickname? Is it because you were doing the solo missions? Is it just because you were kind of a well-known face of the American side in, in the war on terror in Iraq? Like where did the sheriff of Baghdad come from? <laughs> uh, a buddy of mine, he is a retired Sergeant major. He was that, I think the number he was the operations sergeant major of the 82nd airborne. So like out of the division, he's like the number two sergeant major when he retired. And uh, he, he worked for the state department in Baghdad in the crisis action center. And uh, basically like, you know, there's people that work in an embassy or something bad happens. They're like the conduit, all the information comes to them. Right. Like, they try to get like, you know, the host nation involved with their people. The con it's the conduit for what's going on, right? Well, a crisis action planner in an embassy during a war when the army actually owns that country while the army's there pretty much has nothing to do, right? right. Like that makes what, sense. what crisis is the army, is the, the embassy going to get in today? There's a war going on. It's all crises. So he's yeah. like... I didn't have anything to do. And uh, so he made some t-shirts and it had like the, I don't know, the embassy logo on the front with like the Baghdad embassy, like official state department, that logo. And on the back, it said like real big across the shoulder sheriff, like a police shirt. 
And then smaller under it, it said a Baghdad. And then even smaller under it, it said serving strategic policy, one citizen at a time. Right. So, so that- he, he made a bunch of these shirts and he tried to give them out in the embassy in Baghdad to his co-workers. And of course, the State Department. Um, mostly uh, very political, educated type people didn't think this was funny. So uh, he had a bunch of these shirts. So later he worked for me when I was a Sergeant Major. So he's like, hey, Sergeant Major, what size shirt are you? I'm like, I don't know. We're like a double, triple X. Why? He's like, if I had a bunch of double, triple Xs, could I give them to you? I'm like, yeah, right. Because we don't wear uniforms. So every time I fight, I need a t-shirt. Every time I do cardio, work out, anything, I, I use t-shirts. And then I still make them these days. I make these cheap shirts. I wear it out. I throw it away. I get buy another one. So he gave me a ton of these shirts. I just started wearing them because they were free shirts, right? Like, and everywhere I went, every pistol match, every sniper competition, everything I did for fun on the weekends, I just wore my Sheriff of Baghdad shirt because I thought it was funny. And then over time, people just started calling me the Sheriff of Baghdad. Like, I like people, that. people thought I made those shirts because this was my name or something. And like, that really didn't pan out like that. Well, that's a fun story. That's an interesting origin story, <laughs> too. So I want to get into some general um, just kind of military stuff that our fans always ask about for stuff like this. Is it better when you're trying to be in Delta to be really smart or just really athletic if it's one or the other? Or do you have to be a combination of both? Neither one of those will get you there. Okay. Great you answer. Be the most athletic guy on the planet and not get selected. And it happens every single day. Uh, You know, when I went to selection, you get there and there's like dudes with like Iron Man t-shirts and Boston marathons. Like I'm from Chicago. I never even fucking seen a mountain in my life. You know what I mean? I'm like, how the, how the fuck a regular guy going to like me going to compete, compete with these fucking guys. Right. Well, guess what? You can be super fit and still not fit the mold make sense yeah and then smart if you're too smart you won't charge the machine gun nest and that's bad so you can't be too smart but if you're too dumb charge a machine gun nest you run right for it you died in one second that's not great either right so you got to be somewhere in the middle but the unit selects on the smarter end of somewhere in the middle right and then one of the shrinks told me years ago I was like, hey, what is the niche? There's a niche there they look for, right? Can't be too smart, can't be too dumb, can't be, can't be, you know, can't be a slug, but you could be super fit, still not make it. You got to be like the total package, right? So I asked him and he told me, he was like, you know, I'll give you an example. He's like, if humanity fits on a scale from one to a hundred, the unit selects, and, and I think he just made this up, but he's like, the unit selects at 88.5 to 88.7. Yeah, very narrow. Yeah. And he's like, you know what else fits in there? Criminals, like in the movie Heat, professional criminal shit like that, right? And, and I would say this, I think the, one of the biggest things I think a guy has to learn in the unit is there's a difference between right and wrong. And there's a difference. There's a big difference between right and wrong. A unit guy needs to be able to say, fuck it, we're doing it like this because this is the right way, no matter if it's right or wrong, right? You need to be able to know the law and say, fuck the law to get the job done, right? Because this happens to police every single day. They got to know the law and they stop because they can't break the law. You know what I mean? Or or they're just, or they're terrified. I I think a lot of cops are terrified if they do their job, they're going to get fucked anyways. And so then they're just terrified. Um, No, that was a good answer. That's pretty fascinating. Uh, Are you guys like, is the community really close knit while you're in Delta? Like you spend time with guys outside of when you're, when you're on the base, things like that, or is it everyone has their own lives and it's like a sports team. They just come and play. Yeah. Yeah. You work together. That's about it. I think the unit guys are the worst as a fraternity 
afterwards, you know, so competitive that even at 50 years old, first off, it's a very, the army will never be a big enough pool to keep the unit full one. Having said that, everybody came from somewhere where you know somebody, you know, so there's still 50 year old men out there that hell hate other 50 plus year old men because he banged his girlfriend when they were 18 when they lived in fucking Fort Benning or some stupid fucking shit like that. So uh, as good as it is and as high a level as you get, there's still some fucking stupid shit out there, army shit, but you're not going to get away with, you know what I mean? So uh, unit guys are generally smarter, a little bit more experienced. However, there is bullshit between guys. And this is why I say it's a terrible fraternity later um, is guys will hold that grudge. And then the unit is always pitting guys against guys. What do you mean by that? How so? Well, that's called competition. Okay. So think about this. I'm pitting you against the, the members on your team. I'm pitting you against the members of your troop, your squadron. You know what I mean? Everyone wants to be number one. Everyone wants to have the biggest dick, right? But when it's time to actually get the ruler out and measure, no one's going to show up, right? And then this is just how it works. So you're going to have the humanity factor of, you know, of stuff like that. You know, I, I would say this is, I think people get shocked when I say this, but I don't ever get to explain it. And, and I think this is just life. There's people in life that you're going to meet and in 10 minutes, hey, you want to you wanna go hang out? You want to go do something, right? And there's people where you talk to them and in 10 minutes, like, I'm not ever going to dinner to this person. I'm not going <laughs> to be close to them. However, it doesn't nullify anything that person is or does as a human being. It just means we didn't click, right? right? So there's like, there's guys in the unit that I know will come save your fucking ass. No doubt about it, Right. I may not invite that guy to my house. I may not want that guy babysitting my kids. I may not, I may not want that guy around my wife. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, however, when it comes time to do this, I want him there. So I think a lot of people don't realize that, but because of all of that, the unit is a terrible after fraternity, right? That, because guys carry that competition to their grave. They always want to be better than you. Right. And then guys like me, the average guy, like I'm just an average guy. I just work. You know, the only reason I ever made any of this is I work hard. Two, two reasons. One, I work hard. Two, I had nothing to go back to. You know what I mean? A lot of guys I served with had like just peachy lives. You know what I mean? Like I grew up poor on the south side of Chicago in 19 fucking 70. You know what that's like? You know how my parents were drunk. I lived in a bar. I got beat all the time. Like, you know what I mean? So the fact that these guys hate each other later in life and, and, and it's so competitive that they hate each other now, even then was just mind blowing to me. You know what I mean? Like these guys are fighting about what, like, the biggest thing that made me where I was is I had nowhere to go back to. You know what I mean? A lot of guys are like, well, fuck this. I'll just go home. Like, yo, I can't. <laughs> yeah. like, the forward is no the only me. answer, right? Yeah. So a lot of these guys are fucking dicks. And, and so as an after fraternity, right, we're, we're horrible. I do more Ranger and SF stuff than I do unit stuff these days. Only That's... because it's more a fraternity than the unit ever was. That's fascinating stuff. Hmm. I, mean, I haven't now, heard that. From... Now, there is guys out there that I love these fuckers and I'll go to my grave loving these guys and I'd go to dinner. I'd do anything with them. Right. And there's also guys I don't give a fuck about. And there's guys I wouldn't go to dinner with They're, you know, so I guess what I'm saying is, is it's it's like working anywhere else. You know right I mean? yeah it's like, like if, any other job if, if you were a postman i bet you there's another postman that you hate <laughs> you right. know what i mean and then i bet there's one you drink with on the weekends right uh, um but as after fraternities i think the unit's the worst out of all of them interesting i hadn't heard that before now this is my favorite question to ask and it always spins people up depending on what branch they're from the old classic seal team six delta force debate you obviously were a unit guy, but in your mind, are they equivalent? Is there a gap between no, the two? They're not equivalent. They right, weren't. Take, take it away. 
If you go back to the original charter, which most fuckers don't, not even the fucking seals, you go back to the original charter, the seals were created to render a ship safe. What does that mean? They take the engine room to make sure it doesn't crash, no one gets hurt, right? Uh, And the Hilo assault force, right, is what clears the ship. That's the unit. This is the charter. It's been like this since fucking 1986 when they put it on fucking paper. Now, having said that, the unit was created as a standalone counter-terrorist organization that reported right to the Pentagon JCS. Now, those linkages are still there, even though the army's gone ahead and there's a fucking million officers these days. There's more officers probably fucking enlisted. Who does the work in the army? Who fucking knows? Uh, But over the years, They added layers of bullshit over the top of that. So the unit went from reporting right to the JCS to JSOC to SOCOM, right? But the linkage is still there. And the unit was created to be standalone. It needs nothing, right? Right, because you guys have your... It wasn't created to do long-term warfare, but it was created to be standalone. The Navy was created, right? to do a waterside terrorism, but they were never created to stand alone because we already had a primary hostage rescue unit that could be another force. What we need is very specific stuff. And this is how the charter actually started and was written. And that's the logic behind where the charter was at the time, right? So the SEALs cannot deploy without JSOC. The unit can. So the unit needs no one to deploy and they have all their own people, right? The SEALs have to depend on augmentees to run their support out of JSOC and JSOC just does the lottery order to fucking, oh, we need supply guys, put the lottery fucking, someone will get ordered to come here. So So having said that, the SEALs could never be an equivalent to the unit because they weren't created to do any of that and still are not. So that leads into the next question, which I'm sure you're going to figure out what it is. When they did uh, Neptune Spear, flew into Pakistan and shot Bin Laden, what was the feeling within the army side of like, hey, why were they chosen and not Delta? Oh, easy. Agency playing games. What do you I don't explain give a that? fuck if it's Bin Laden. I don't care who it is. If you got the intel and you're not going to tell me the whole fucking story for whatever reason, the unit's going to tell you no. So you think, that, so was the unit initially offered, uh, were they initially in the mix and when they didn't get a full intel package, they were like, fuck off? Yep. And then they went with uh, SEAL Team 6? Yep. That's interesting. I, I'd never heard now, that before. I think there's another major factor in there is you've got McRaven, who's a fucking admiral. And he was a former uh, SEAL Team 6 guy. That's correct, right? Mm-hmm. And so I, the, think, I think when the unit told him to fuck off because the intel was... <clears throat> didn't have any intel there's no intel so think about that every other target we needed intel on but yet you're just going to give me an address for this guy right seems a little sketchy i, I think i think there's some wonky shit going on i believe the unit probably told him to fuck off and in the same breath The admiral was like, amazing, because I know guys that won't ask any questions that'll do this. Interesting. Well, so that's that's another interesting point of view. I mean, obviously, Delta smoked the head of ISIS now back to back two years apart. They got Baghdadi and then they got um, that dickhead that came after him, what, four months ago or so? Um, I, I've just always find that interesting. I ask that to everyone I interview. They all have opinions all over the place. The Delta guys stick, obviously, with the Delta side. The, the Navy guys are, of course, staying with their side. But anyways, um, yeah, what's well, the cl- most of the guys you talk to wasn't the money SAR major that held the Navy's money also and the unit's money. And most of them didn't see both. Most of them didn't sit at the flagpole where the charter was written and understand how it was supposed to pan out. And I would tell you this, you probably haven't talked to one guy that has been in my position to see all that. Well, that's very true. And that's why I'm asking you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you, you, you know, what's funny is all the time people are like, oh, you just hate the SEALs. Uh, no, I don't. Matter of fact, the reason I say this is 
Well, I held a part of their budget. I seen it firsthand. Right. And, and, and to be, and I think you would say this as well, those guys are still excellent shooters. Like those guys show up, they, they're capable of killing bad guys at a high level, obviously. I would say they're as capable as a really good SF team. Yeah. I've heard that comparison before. Yeah. But, um, I, I, I know some, SF teams that are, that will fucking smoke those guys too. Fair enough. I, this was a question from a fan. Have you ever had to steal a vehicle during a mission? Um, man, that's a great question. I think I've stole about 38 or 40 cars and bags. There you go. So the answer to that, to the fan out there watching is, and do they give you guys training, obviously, before you go of like, here's how you hotwire a car, here's how you get it going or whatever. I don't know shit about that. I am a master carjacker and locksmith, yes. That is badass. That's pretty neat. All right, I got some current event questions to kind of round this thing out. Um, we've obviously seen a war going on in Ukraine with uh, yeah. Russia. Um, uh, but it, this is more of a fun question. Red Dawn is my favorite movie ever made, the 1984 version. Of course. In, the, in, the event, in the event that Americans wake up and see paratroopers coming down from the sky, what advice do you have for people in a potential Red Dawn invasion situation? Mm. Yeah, I love this. Let's make this fucking easy. If every fucking American, literally, whoever falling from the sky, give them a nationality. I don't give a fuck who they are. Doesn't matter. Every American who owns a gun should kill one fucking person. That and is this an is why answer. Japan never, this is why Japan didn't invade, right? And you know, you know what Japan's research was prior to uh, Pearl Harbor? No, I'm attacking American hunting licenses. Really? That's there were 600,000, I think, hunters in World War II, right? So think about this, just hunters, people that own a hunting rifle that could shoot a deer in the woods at, let's just say, 50 to 100 yards. That was enough to scare the Japanese army away. And why? Because that's 600,000 people that could come out of the woodwork while you're right. trying to fight an army. Right. Absolutely. Think about it. If every, I mean, and, and this is why, this is where Ukraine went wrong. In Helsinki in 1995, when they got rid of their nukes because Russia's going to be nice to them and everything's hunky-dory, they should have gave every adult male an AK to store at home with a thousand rounds. Think about where they would have been the initial invasion. And then think about this. What do you think the initial invasion of Russian troops into Ukraine was? How many? Uh, 15,000. I have no idea. 15,000. Okay. Think about this. 15,000 civilians with one bullet each. Could Dessene made an army with pot shots in fucking days? And all I would ask is everybody shoots one bad guy. I, I agree with you. That's the same mindset that I would say too. I mean, uh, and that kind of pushes into what we're seeing now. Anyone who looks at your Instagram knows that you, you're a gun guy. You like to shoot. You obviously have combat experience. Right now, there's been serious debate about banning semi-automatic weapons, banning rifles. Biden said he wanted to get rid of nine millimeter handguns because apparently they can blow your lung yeah. clean out of your yeah. body. Yeah. Uh, NPR said you can behead people with a five five six round. So, uh, sorry, yeah, sorry. I, I don't know if you I don't know if you saw it, but they did. You, you're an expert on this stuff. You're an expert yeah. on weapons. When yeah. you hear the U.S. government telling people we're taking your semi-automatic weapons away, what do you feel? Take guns away. They're coming here next. Same as fucking Ukraine. No bullshit. No fucking. I'm not going back in history to show you another fucking lesson. Ukraine right now. It's all you see on the news. If you don't believe that that could happen here, you're fucking high just fucking high smoking crack you're not even on this planet because the thought the thought that you use to get here is zero i would say this <clears throat> it is far too late for america to get rid of guns right and even even if i get rid of every fucking gun tomorrow there'd still be gun crime why criminals don't follow rules you can't legislate you can't regulate and you can't control evil acts. 
Right. Absolutely. So get rid of guns, get rid of guns right now. World War Three will fucking happen. That's what I would tell America. You want to get rid of anything with guns right now? We're closer to World War Three than ever fucking before. Because if we start getting rid of destroying guns, that tells the Chinese and the Russians that we're fucking prime to come in. Right. No, I right? because that, that... these governments don't want to go against a fucking massive armed population. Right. They want to just come in and kill one or two people, your family members. And then they're going to tell you it's okay again, by golly. Well, I can tell from talking uh, to you that you're, you're not a very trusting person of the government, which I think is a healthy place to be. So do you find it ironic when you see politicians, uh, certainly more on one side of the aisle than the other, that have armed bodyguards that you and I pay for as taxpayers, but then they'll get on TV mm. and lecture mothers in the inner city. You say you're from the south side of Chicago. You can't have a gun there. You can't have a pistol there. But I'm going to use your tax dollars to get my bodyguards fully automatic weapons. Does that hypocrisy strike you a little bit? Not only is that hypocrisy strike me, but what really pisses me off is AOC, right? 29-year-old girl. I got nothing against her. She got elected in New York. The people are with her. The people are with her. She has the fucking secret service with her 24 fucking seven, right? But your fucking four-year-old kindergartner don't get fucking shit. Doesn't get shit. Matter of fact, anyone can walk into any school and gun down as many fucking kids as they want in this country. And we're not going to do shit about it. Hey, Open the front door of the Congress building and tell people to come in and we're going to throw all those fuckers in jail to include a lot of the left staffers that were in the crowd, which isn't a big, you don't hear that in the media, right? But what I would say is, look, I don't think any politician names armed bodyguards and I'm going to tell you fucking why. You do shit the people off and they want to fucking come kill you. Maybe you ain't doing your job right. You know what I mean? Capitol building. If all them fucking politicians that were scared in their chamber from all the savages, you mean a fucking regular American scare you, you're in the wrong fucking place and you're saying the wrong shit to the wrong fucking people. Um, I want to, I want to um, touch on something you just said about the schools with the situation in Texas. Now, you obviously have been trained in close quarter combat, hostage rescue, at, shoot, you know, taking down guys who are firing. Yeah. I don't know if you saw the photos, but there were the photos of all those police officers in the hallway with the ARs, body armor, ballistic shields. Door was unlocked. They never even tried it. You're an expert on a situation like this, too. Is there ever a reason in an active shooter situation to sit and wait if you've got the gear yourself? And even if you're ordered to not go in while the shooting's going on, doesn't a time come where you got to say fuck, which is what the border patrol ended up doing, where you got to say fuck that. We're not just going to sit here and do nothing. Yeah. Um, police in the United States have grown way too accustomed to just give it some time. It'll pan itself out. Right. Way too accustomed to that. One. Two. America has been. I don't even know how to say it. America has been trying to keep down, put their thumb on, push down out of society. Men, masculinity. Of all the fucking men that were in Uvalde, Texas that day, only one was an alpha male. Don't you think the 19 other fucking cops that were there with another one, which would have made 20 guys going after a fucking high school kid. If you would have told me in Iraq, if you would have came to me, let's say you worked at a government agency and this happened to me all the fucking time. They'd be like, I got a guy. I don't know what to do with him. He, he, he hurt me last time I talked to him as a source. Okay, get in my fucking taxi. I'll drive. Where's your source at right now? We'll go find him. I'll throw him in my trunk. I'll pull him out. I'll fucking lump him the fuck up. I'll sit him in a chair and then say, talk to this motherfucker. Guess who's talking, right? right. 
The reality is, is we've, we've masculinity are bad. Men are bad. This is bad. And this is where this enters because there, if there was a sport for cowards, it's killing innocents. Oh, absolutely. I agree with you. 100%. Right. And, and it takes a coward to kill a coward. One fucking guy with a gun stands in front of a kid with a gun and every one of these shooting fucking things with the gun ends up jamming. That's why more people don't die because a little bit of pressure, they don't have the skill, right. To maintain the weapon, to keep it running, to keep it going. Right. They don't have that skill. But the problem is masculinity. We're trying to get rid of men because men are bad and everyone should be right. Because if, if you just have straight sex, you can't say shit, but if you put on a dress and makeup and sing fucking Madonna in a cone bra, no matter what body parts you got, you can come to a school and tell my kids what they fucking, what their sex should be when they're adults. Insanity. Yeah, no, it's, it's fucking crazy. bullshit. So mass shooting. If you look at the mass shootings and number of guns in this country, and you look at it over the years, almost none through the 70s. It wasn't until the 80s. And guess what happened? hippies fucking peace love all that shit the downfall of masculinity is why shootings is on the fucking rise hey have a fucking dad get smacked in the yes. mouth once or twice as a fucking kid you know what i mean i can tell you this if i'd have thought of i'd have got it worse at home from my parents right than anything a fucking school a cop anything could have done for that doesn't happen anymore because we wanted all our kids to have better lives. We want a better place. And really what we did is we just made fucking <laughs> cowards. We're building cowards right now. Well, well one of the stats that always uh, sticks out to me about the school shootings is if you look at the last 10 major school shootings, one thing they all have in common, there's no dad in the home. The no. dad's either dead, absent, whatever, whatever it might be. And that is a question someone's got to answer. Like, that's a trend. And to me, to your point, like, when you don't grow up around strong male role models, you start to be, I mean, you just don't have anyone to guide you. And then in the most tragic situations, evil situations, you have what we had in Texas. But I, to me, I, to bring it back to the original point, I will never understand why those cops sat in that hallway as they heard gunshots go off and just didn't do shit. It's mind boggling to me. They're cowards. The cops don't give a fuck about your kids. <laughs> Who's ever listened to this, know this now. It is not your fucking police officer's job to maintain your kid's security. It's not. It's fucking yours, right? And I'll tell you this. As a parent, you think them motherfuckers would have stopped me if my kid was inside? I don't think they would have, no. Yeah. Not only that, but you might have a couple dead cops, which would have made a bigger fucking problem. Oh, a parent dunces some cops to get through to kill a bad guy. Who's the bad guy now? Yeah. The and, parent and, who's trying to protect his kids? Well, I don't know if you heard. They did the one of the the husband of the, one of the teachers who was killed was a police officer. She called him as she was bleeding out. It's heartbreaking. He said, I've been shot. I'm going to die. He raced to the school, had his service weapon. The cops arrested him at the school and took his weapon away from him. They, I mean, it, I don't want to get off track here, but that to me, it, it's, it's just disgusting on so many levels. Um, yeah. All right. Well, last question. This is kind of a fun one. Um, UFOs are in the news all the time. You see yeah. a lot of military yeah. uh, UFO things in your yeah. career. Have you yeah. ever seen anything that you just couldn't explain? Oh, yes. Okay. Well, not like UFOs, but yes. Okay. Well, the, okay. Then UFOs aside, what's something you saw that you just couldn't explain? There's houses that you will go in in Iraq or Afghanistan where like they actually behead people and they rape people and they've been doing it in this location for generations because this is where the tribe, family, whatever you want to call it lives. I have been in places where like you didn't want to be there. All the hair stands up on my body and I'm, I'm a hairy guy, you know. Uh, and then there'll be a couple times where you know, I'll go in as like the one man I'm going in and I'm slowing down. Like, I don't think I want to be here and then uh, turn around and like, no one came in behind me. So I go outside, like you guys let me go in alone. Like if I, I ain't going in there, dude, I don't even know how you got that fucking far. <laughs> and they'll be like, is that building clear? You'd be like, clear enough. Well, is it secure? No. 
Well, you got to go in and clear it. We're not going in. So there's evil in the world. There's old evil in the world. I've felt it. It's out there. Uh, I believe a lot of guys drag that old evil shit back here too. So UFOs, do I believe there's UFOs? I think it's fucking stupid to think if it, if we actually were started with one fucking cell and starts came out of water with a fucking tail and got to here and the billions of years that took, I don't know how old the universe is, but it seems like there's billions of years that could have spawned other shit like us. So I think it's ridiculous to think that we're the only planet out of fucking all the planets that have fucking people. I I enjoy UFO theories. That's why I put it as the fun question to close things out. And sounds like you're open-minded on it. You're not ruling it out. It's very possible to you. Well, dude, okay, let's be honest. The fucking origin story of human beings in general, right? Tell me that's a fucking solid story. I have no idea because I'm not an expert right? on it. I'm not even going right. to pretend. Well, I'm an expert on fucking being lied to interrogations. And I can tell you when I see holes and shit, I don't, I don't think we fucking evolved. Interesting. Well, no, and I, that, that's why I ask. I love hearing opinions on it. I personally think we are probably remnants of another dying planet who got their last few fucking people here. That'd be a badass thing if it was true. That'd be a crazy way to look at it. But, you know, that would, if that was true, guess the other shit you'd have to admit. Yeah, the lot. I mean, that that would blow everyone. Society would not be ready for that. <laughs> yeah. But anyways, this has been an awesome interview. This has been great. Uh, thanks, you're, you're, man. Yeah. You're a fun dude. Is uh, Where can people find you on social media or if they want to read more about you or visit yeah. your website, where can they, where can they get you at? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm normally on Instagram. I like out of all of them. We do all, I do all of them. So I'm on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Uh, I ain't on Snapchat. Why we used to do that. I'm on all of them. Normally SOB tactical at SOB tactical. Uh, I like Instagram the best. Cause it's like, look at the picture or video, press the heart button or move the fuck on. I don't need your opinion from your grandparents basement. Cause you're having a fucking bad month. Like I, I, I'm not that interested. You know what I mean? Now, if you came into my house and you were having a bad month, well, we'd have some food and booze and we'd talk about it. But over the internet, not that interested. But uh, yeah, SOB Tactical. Uh, if you go to Instagram, you know, uh, that's normally where I am. I answer, I try to answer all the comments. I try to answer everyone's comments on every platform of everything because I believe in the First Amendment. I think everyone has an opinion. Um, I try to answer as many questions as possible. But uh, I have a flow page um uh the link in the bio on instagram if you go there it's one of them link pages where every time an article comes out i'll link to it you know so it's got the latest articles it's got some guy wrote my origin story which was like better than i could do because i'm pretty much illiterate so uh i just put a link to that so if you go to the the bio and instagram and you click on the flow page link there is a ton of stuff in there yeah uh but yeah uh hit me up man i'm on all the platforms um i try to answer all the questions and i just started this because my family has i'm an older brother and he just had so he's got so many questions for me you know what i mean or a guy like me because how many people have access to a guy like me not right so then my family just asked me questions all the time i got so used to it i started doing it on instagram And then, um, I don't know, I just, I like helping. I enjoy helping. I enjoy being able to share my experience. Like a lot of stuff in like, you know, I teach a lot of classes, a lot of gun classes, a lot of stuff guys are like, well, this is how we do it. Like, yeah, that's how I used to do it too. Let me show you this way. (laughs) And then I'd be like, what? This is so much easier. Like, yeah, that's, that's what, 10 years of fucking around like this, this is what it's going to come to anyway. So let me just start you here and then you go from there. Right. So I I really enjoy to help. Uh, I miss kind of like, I'll tell you what I miss. I don't miss the army. Um, I do miss talking shit. Like in the army, we talk shit every day, like mom jokes and people don't do that anymore. Right. And it's like, you can't make fun of anybody anymore. 
and because of that like i don't know it's just like we used to have like you know on days where like there's nothing to do we used to just talk trash to each other on purpose intentionally you know what i mean and people don't do that anymore i think that's one of the biggest things i miss like i don't people like do you miss it no war is a shit show you know what i mean <laughs> the army's like for fucking it's on a kindergarten level and it needs to be you know uh what i do miss is like you know talking shit with people having fun you know like saying something inappropriate where oh my god it was funny not like you know harming somebody or just words you know what i mean so i think that's one of the things i miss the most is just talking shit damn well john i'd like to thank you for uh taking some time out of your busy schedule and joining me this is a hell of an interview and uh yeah anyone watching this you heard them where you can check them out we'll call that a day dude yeah come check me out sob tactical thanks for having me man good talk